have the honor of introducing our second Knock Your Socks Off plenary speaker of today, um, Jennifer Ho. Uh, Jennifer works for HUD Secretary Cast um, Castro, so the HUD Secretary, the very top head of the HUD agency. Um, she is his senior advisor for housing and services. So we, I know we all work very hard on a local level to try to figure out how do we combine housing and services in just the right way so that we can truly meet the needs of our clients. Um, Jennifer is responsible for making sure that all the policies are aligned and, that, and to make our lives easy. So, so we're very fortunate <laughs> to have her here today. I had the great honor of working with Jennifer um, on the Federal Strategic Plan Opening Doors, and she is a true force of nature. Um, she comes from Minnesota um, and is in Washington um, bringing her expertise in, deep expertise in um, both Medicare and Medicaid, um, managed care, how to combine services with housing, um, she also rides a motorcycle, and I'm trying to think what else there is, but I have That's about enough. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, and we are truly fortunate to have her with us today, because we know how busy she is. in the neighborhood for about six years and uh, I've been hearing so much about what great collaborators the folks who work here in Montgomery County are so I'm really thrilled for the invitation and the opportunity to, to come out and spend a little time with you. Um, check your socks I guess because rumor has it that Sam probably knocked them off uh, <laughs> earlier today. I love Sam. It, it embarrasses him how much I love Sam. So I am. Um, but but I mean, uh, this guy is the father of Housing First, and uh, really everything I learned at the very beginning of the work that I started doing, I learned from Sam and other people that were doing the work around the country. But one of the things that I really loved, I remember hearing you speak on uh, public radio, Robert Siegel, and back in the early 2000s, I think this was, and he just put it in such simple terms. You ask people what they want, and you give it to them, and usually what they want. And so began this movement uh, that we call Housing First, so began this whole change in federal policy, this realignment of work, and finally, uh, for the first time after a long, steady growth in the number of people experiencing homelessness in America, we see a real trending downward and in the right direction. And so it's an honor, it's always an honor uh, to be with you, Sam, and want folks in the room to know uh, how lucky they are to have you here. Also, um, Susie and I had a chance to work together when we were writing Opening Doors back in 2010. And uh, so I was thinking about coming back, and I'm starting to get a little reflective, a little, a little sentimental. I mean, six years is a long time. How many people have been doing your work for six years or longer? Yeah, it's a long time to be doing you know, the, same, the same thing sometimes. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, what it's meant to be working with the Obama administration for the last six years. What does it mean to be moving into the final innings of the administration? And what is it uh, that I see going forward in this work um, after so much tremendous progress has happened? So first of all, I got a chance to see your point time results. Um, pretty amazing, under 1,000 people. And reductions in families, reductions in veterans, reductions in individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, that's good news. Give yourself a hand. That's great news. I want to say uh, that the work that we've done on veterans has taught us a lot about what it is that we need to do generally, right? When we were writing Opening Doors, we really believed that you needed to build a system. There was no such thing as a homeless system. In fact, we, we, we fought in the choosing of words about whether we were transforming a system or building a system. Because in reality, there weren't systems of care for people experiencing homelessness. There were a bunch of providers, many of which were doing their own thing, oftentimes without talking to each other. So we needed to build a system that was driven by better data. 
And obviously, I mean, critical to everything working is that we had to have the right interventions available to people based on what an individual needed. As opposed to the way things had historically worked that said we had a program that does X, Y, and Z for people that look like A, B, and C, and if you fit, good, but if you don't, you know, too bad. So, you know, that's been really critical. The other piece has been really critical is, is figuring out how the mainstream programs, the things that aren't targeted homeless assistance, fit into the equation. So, you know, HUD VASH is fantastic. So are the rest of the Hazard Choice Vashers, right? You know, uh, the SAMHSA, I saw Jamie, uh, the services from SAMHSA are great, uh, but so are the services in Medicaid. So thinking about the way that we approach homelessness, not just from the lens of the targeted homelessness programs, but really from the lens of all the resources that are available in the community. So when you think about what the formula is that's been so successful with veterans, first of all, Congress has invested year after year, in a bipartisan way, in the interventions uh, that we know are game-changing or work, HUD VASH, Supportive Services for Veterans Families. Um, you've got HUD and the VA getting on the same page and figuring out how to work together. Lisa knows that I'll say this, but at the beginning, we didn't count veterans the same way, we didn't define veterans the same way. It took a lot of work for us to get on the same page to make sure that we were aligned as we were asking communities to align. But then also, the amazing transformation in the relationships between the VA medical centers locally, the public housing agencies, the continuums of care, and figuring out how to work together, but also work together in new and different ways that really were results oriented. So, you know, money, better data, stronger collaborations, and then also that sense of urgency that sense of mission, the idea that we weren't going to house the veterans that we housed, but that we were actually going to house every single veteran. And I think that what that has done is really forced us, oh, I'm on camera, aren't I? I want to say that. Is to really <laughs> inhale deeply the concepts of housing first, right? Because if you've got somebody who's been out on the street for 20 years, 30 years, and everything else that you have done isn't connected, then you can't leave this person out and feel like you effectively ended veterans homelessness. You have to change your systems to figure out how to engage them and welcome them in. So I really think that that sense of urgency, having a date, uh, that sense of mission that no veteran who has served this country should be on the street really forced some systemic change to rethink the way that we're doing things and what we're doing so that what we were doing was going to reach every single person. So I, I really do want to compliment you on the extraordinary work that you have done thus far and the commitment that you're making to not having it be a one and done, but to continue in that work but also the way in which you're translating the lessons learned into the work on chronic illnesses. Now, it's a little trickier on chronic homelessness because we don't have Congress making, in a bipartisan way, investments year after year in the interventions that we now work, most notably permanent support housing. I want to say it's not for lack of asking. <laughs> it's not for lack of asking. And this year, once again, the president's put into his budget proposal an investment in the HUD, a continuum of care grants that would allow us to do 25,500 additional units of supportive housing, which is the number that we believe is necessary to leverage the resources to effectively end chronic homelessness in America. I don't know what Congress is going to do. <laughs> you know, um, we're in political silly season. Um, you know, uh, they're going to be home a lot this summer and up until the election. Um, but I think the fact that they're going to be home is a great opportunity to remind them how these targeted interventions, how these permanent housing and permanent supportive housing interventions transform lives, transform systems, and are getting results back home. Um, they've got good stories to tell about the work that you're doing here. 
but they need to be telling those stories every day to their colleagues. Because what we're not seeing is despite all the momentum that we're seeing around the country on this issue, despite the fact that Congress hasn't made the investments, it, that we're seeing this momentum. And imagine what a national competition for 25,500 initial units of support housing would do in terms of helping you reach your goal. So just something to think about. Um, the other big opportunity on, you know, is to, is to really prove that we're using the resources that we have in the most effective ways. And I know that's not easy. I know you guys made hard decisions uh, in the continuum of care competition. But I think that you made the right decisions, and I think that they're going to show you results. You know, I mean, the, the critical part here is that we can't have supportive housing units that aren't targeted. We can't house people in some willy-nilly way that's not prioritized. And so the system that you're putting in place not only helps make sure that people who are the most vulnerable are the folks that are getting into the next open supportive housing unit, but when you do that, you are also proving to yourself and to your community that you know how to house the hard folks. That you know how to house the hard folks. Because you can't just start where it's easier and expect that you're going to coast to some finish line. So congratulations on making tough decisions. And um, you know, nobody said ending homelessness was going to be easy. Right? I mean, I think about like who we're talking about when we're talking about individuals experiencing chronic illness. We're talking about people with mental illness, addiction, a lot of chronic health conditions, most of which have been exacerbated by living on the street or not just not having a home for a long period of time. And so you now have a healthcare system that is paying attention to people that they didn't used to pay as much attention to because they were uninsured, because they came and went through the system. And we're finally able to capitalize on all the research that we have around the fact that it's actually in the healthcare system's best interest to pay attention to, going on, to what's going on in the lives of people who use the emergency room 90 times in a year. So I think that what has finally happened is not dissimilar to what has happened between HUD and the VA on the work on veterans homelessness. But we've really seen this evolution of the relationship between HUD and the Center for Medicaid on the fact that Medicaid is critical to ending homelessness, but that housing is critical to accomplishing the goals of health reform. So this is an area that I really expect to see a lot more work being done uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming months and years. So we're also doing a lot of work in DC to make sure that the work on family and youth homelessness gets on the same trajectory as the work on veterans and families. And for those of you who work every day with families and kids um, and with young adults, I want to promise you that we never viewed these goals as sequential. And that every day in Washington, D.C., we're working on all the goals at once. And I know that some communities, it has been easier to focus on the veterans first because that's where the resources have been. But we have to be building that system's capacity at the same time in the work that we're doing with families. And, you know, I mean, in some ways, the work with veterans um, you know, is about families, too, because we have more and more veterans who have kids. And I think we've learned some stuff working with, with veterans with kids that can help translate over. I think we've learned some stuff about coordinated entry and the impact and triage that can help us with families. So there's a lot of stuff here in terms of how it is that we um, take advantage of the partnerships, the collaboration, the better data, the better systems, um, the willingness to let go, go of some older ways of doing things and embrace some newer ways of doing things in order to have an impact. Now, in addition to the stuff that the president put into his 17 budget proposal inside of rapid rehousing and some uh, targeted vouchers for families in the regular budget, the president also made a really audacious budget proposal of what it would take to end family homelessness in America. We said $11 billion over 10 years, predominantly invested in rapid rehousing and housing choice vouchers that are aligned with the continuum of care and coordinated entry. 
And we're not just making this stuff up, right? I mean, we have learned a lot about modeling and about impact and about inflow and triage and how it is that you put together the right set of resources. So there's an audacious proposal on the table for what we think it would actually take to end family homelessness. One of the reasons I think that it's so important so we got folks over in Congress who are telling us that our proposal is a gift to handle that influx of resources during the time that we fight in order to get them. So coordinated entry, um, you know, using good triage tools, getting good data, not just about how to target, but understanding who comes back, and use information about who comes back to shelter to figure out how to do more targeted interventions to help make sure that they um, are stably placed in housing as opposed to just exiting shelter. So there's so much that we can be doing on the family side of the equation. And I think, you know, too, when we think about the work on family homelessness, the systems change work gets kind of exponentially more complicated than it is with veterans and, and even to some extent for individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. Because we're talking about child welfare systems. We're talking about TANF. We're talking about the whole workforce system. We're talking about schools. So how is it that we get all of those systems to the table and understand that we might be different systems, but we're talking about the same families? And how is it that we figure out how it works together differently? So places that I see that are making big headway on family homelessness are really grappling with some of these systems change issues in addition to the changes that they're making inside of their homeless system. I, um, so I have 248 days left before my job's done. And we have a new president, and a new team takes over. You know, so you know, the media has been paying a lot of attention to who's going to be the next president. And obviously, it's a very important conversation that we're having in America. But I spend a lot of time thinking about who will lead the US Emergency Council on Homelessness. Who will be the Secretary of HUD? Who's going to be the next me? I am. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's just really, really important to think about how we're taking all the momentum that we've built over the last six and a half years and figuring it out how to make sure that it is moving forward with so much force and so much consensus from the voices that speak to uh, congressional folks and will speak to the new leadership when they take office so that we can't lose that momentum. And so the last commitment that I have in the time that I have remaining in D.C. is to make sure that we are just as far along on the work with homeless youth as we are on the work with veterans and individuals experiencing chronic homelessness and families. And we are behind. We are behind. I understand that in Montgomery County there's not a strong network of youth providers. So you need to be asking yourself, how do we build youth competence? into a system that's serving families, including young moms with young kids? How do we build youth co competence into a system that's serving adults? You know, where is it that we need to build specific youth serving capacity versus where is it that we bring the system along to understand what's uniquely going on in the developmental lives of young people who are experiencing homelessness? You know, how is it that we build a system that isn't just carved out for LGBT youth, but how do we build a system that's competent to serve LGBT youth no matter where they present? So, you know, we're having a ton of conversations in DC through USICH with HHS and education in terms of thinking through, you know, how do we make everything fit together at a national policy level so that we make it easier for communities to figure out how to put it together at a local level. You know, we've done a lot of thinking about the HHS Runaway and Homeless Youth Programs and how does that fit with the HUD Continuum of Care Programs. We're having a lot of conversations about the role of housing that's not time limited. Uh, whether on the HUD side we think of that as rapid rehousing or supportive housing and what's the role of that. We're thinking a lot about, um, you know, what does housing first mean for a young person? How do we have the right balance of low barrier to entry, but the right kinds of structure that allow uh, young people to succeed. These are hard questions, right? Nobody has completely figured this out yet. 
But, but I think that they're critical questions, and if we can get from where we are to the next level between now and the end of the year, I think that we do have a pretty solid roadmap taking shape for what it is that we need to do to end youth homelessness that will help us um, piggyback or get the same momentum that's been done around other populations. But I know you have work to do. Uh, I know you have work to do here on getting your schools engaged and getting child welfare engaged. I'm just going to take a wild guess that you guys are police. And getting the police, getting the police engaged in that early identification and outreach. You know, how is it that when you encounter a young person on the street, you know how to connect them to services, services that either can help them get safely back home and if they can't go back home safely, get them into a safe place. So all of this stuff is, 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 um, is happening right now, but we have an extraordinary opportunity at HUD because the Senate, the, the Congress gave us new money in the last budget to work with 10 communities to build out systems of what it would look like to any of us. So, you know, we're in the, in the middle of designing how we're going to select those 10 communities, four of which will be rural, um, uh, so, uh, thanks to Senator Collins from Maine, uh, who helped us get the bill. But, you know, 10 communities are going to get selected to build out a system to end youth homelessness and build it out in such a way that the programs that they then fund roll into the continuum of care and build off of some of the infrastructure that's been created on other populations. So I really think that the new money is going to help us get some of the traction um, that hasn't been as visible, perhaps, uh, on the work that we're doing with youth. And I want to let you know, I, uh, I keep looking over at Marcy. I, um, HUD is working so hard on getting a system in place on youth homelessness. And I'll say, when I got to DC six years ago, and even when I got to HUD three years ago, I would say we were still trying to figure out what our role on youth homelessness was. But now we have just completely embraced that we want to be where the action is on any youth homelessness. And they're using our programs. You know, they're, they're, they're coming into contact with the same folks who rely on us for funding, a huge amount of funding, more funding than we thought is actually going out to programs that support youth. So we're all in at HUD on the work of ending youth homelessness. And we want to make sure that communities are keeping up on that as well. So um, it's been an extraordinary opportunity to work inside of the Obama administration on this stuff. And it's not just, um, it's not just, I'm constantly in awe of the commitment from the White House all the way down to the work that we're doing on every homelessness. When I came out to DC, I thought my job was going to be like a sales job, convincing people in federal government that they should be doing something about this. And from my very first week on the job, all I've heard from the people that I report to and the people that they report to, who happen to be the president, is that you need to do more faster for more people. You need to push the data harder. We need to get the best results we can. We have to leave it all out on the field. So having this opportunity to work for a president, first lady, and their team on this issue has been extraordinary. When we wrote Opening Doors, it wasn't like we were sitting in DC, a bunch of bureaucrats, making up federal policy that we were going to hand down to communities. We came from communities. And we took what we saw working across the country, and we brought it into Washington. And we used what was working in communities across the country. I'm almost done, Susie. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> knowledge into federal policy. We brought that knowledge into federal agencies. And we continue to learn all the time as we watch communities put this stuff together, as we watch communities uh, work on ending veterans homelessness and sustain it, as we watch communities continue to push to end chronic homelessness, put systems together for families, put systems together for youth. So, I mean, you have the benefit of being, you know, 
right next door. But I just want you to know that um, that that what we're doing there isn't a bunch of bureaucrats. You know, there's a ton of folks that have worked at community that are doing it. There's also a ton of committed career staff who really have drunk the Kool-Aid and are deeply committed to figuring out how to end homelessness. So I, uh, it's a great pleasure to come out and congratulate you all on the enormous strides uh, that you're making and that you're making by working together in new ways. Um, then I'll take some responsibility about the fact that we're pushing you to make hard decisions and change the way that you're trying to build a system that works better. And a system that works better means that you don't have a crisis system of emergency shelter that people are stuck in that is, doesn't have any room on a, on a given night so that the people who are having a crisis for the first time can't get what they need. You know, what we're doing by shortening length of stay and increasing exits to permanent housing is actually making a shelter system that works. So our goal is not to eliminate the shelter system. Our goal is to eliminate the warehousing system that the shelter systems had become. Now, there are some communities that are downsizing shelter beds because they found out when you got everybody out who had been there three years, and now you have people who are staying 90 days or less, you can actually house 12 times more people with the same number of beds, right? It's a much more efficient system. You know, likewise, it, we have been the tough guys on transitional housing. But the reason is because some transitional housing providers have had really impossible bars to entry, you know? And, you know, they wouldn't take folks who really needed what it was that they were doing. And then the folks that they would take, when they left, they were homeless again. And it was the most expensive thing that we had in our portfolio. So, you know, in Tier 1, you are allowed to make decisions about which programs are critical to the way your system works. And we're not heading towards a zero transitional housing portfolio. We're just helping communities make hard decisions so that the transitional housing programs that were not supporting the efficient operation of the system, there's some leverage to get folks to rethink what they're doing. So my vision is a system where a person in crisis, a family in crisis, a young adult in crisis knows where to go to get help. That place is open, welcoming, accepting, right? And it works with them from the moment that, that they start working together on how can we get you back into a home. And what that pathway looks like for one person could be very different than what that pathway looks like for another person. Whether they're uh, addicted and going into recovery versus whether they're already working and, and, and staying in a shelter. But the system was broken. And um, the system was broken. So we're shaking it up, you know? We're shaking it up. And we have been saying for a long time, we're gonna shake it up, you know? We just shook it up. And I know some folks are feeling shaken. <laughs> you know? We tried to give you ample warning. I, um, you know, so it's not, it's not like, you know, we used to do this and now we're doing this. I agree, that'd be stupid. Good, all right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Don't be super fancy. Shaking up, everybody needs to check that they've got both socks on. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Jennifer. We wish you all the best. We might sign a petition to keep you in DC.